We're going to get this 4.30 meeting started. We do usually leave a little bit of grace period for people trying to park and find the place because we, we've um, designed Pondering Excellence to sit in the time of day when people who don't necessarily live and work on campus can get here. So I think most of you know I'm Janet Carlson. I direct the Center to Support Excellence. The Pondering Excellence series has been a monthly um, speaker series during the school year now going, this is our third year, fourth. Oh, I think it's our fourth, fourth. it's our Five fourth year. Years. Yeah, so that, and I did it a year <laughs> before you were here, okay. Um, so it's, it's continued to grow. We started out with like one talk a quarter and now we're monthly for all three quarters, <laughs> which is great. And I've been very excited today. Jenny Langer Osuna, our speaker, is also part of the CSEP faculty group. Mm. And um, <laughs> her work represents um, the core values of CSET, of which there are three fundamentals of the work at CSET. Promoting equity for all learners, developing t leading teachers, which means teachers who have a presence in the profession in lots of different ways, and um, uh -oh. oh, improving instruction, <laughs> which is rather broad, um, which is why it escaped me for the moment, although we do have some specific ways we do that. And I feel like Jenny's work crosses much of that. I don't know exactly what she's going to do today, but I have a feeling to look at students. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> and teach. Oh, okay. So both. We'll look at both. Um, and her work on identity and its relationship with learning is one of the one of my favorite new learnings in the last four years. And this is another reason I'm excited to have Jenny as our speaker today. Jenny's been at Stanford since 2014, and prior to that, she worked at the University of um, Miami. Miami. And uh, with that, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Janet and CSET, for um, inviting me to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I am excited about the opportunity to speak to you today about some of the work that I've been doing on understanding and supporting um, collaborative math classrooms that foster both uh, inclusive and productive. So my work is um, broadly focused on teaching and learning mathematics in K-12 classrooms, and I focus in particular on understanding um, collaborative math classrooms, or classrooms where students are regularly expected to solve problems together in both small group and whole class uh, discussions, and I'm particularly interested in how students engage in collaborative problem solving with one another when the teacher isn't around, which is typically in um, small group settings. And, um, I'm, and, and, and in, even more specifically, I'm interested in when students are engaged in collaborative work with one another, how students negotiate the collaborative dynamics and its effects on both um, the opportunities to learn and to identify as a learner and doer of mathematics. So I come from, um, the, the lens that I'm, I'm bringing into this is that in order to foster inclusive and robust learning environments, we need to attend to both how students can construct mathematical knowledge together and mathematical selves with one another um, through classroom activity. And furthermore, that the interactions that make up both knowledge and identity construction um, need to really be understood together, not separately with respect to both research and um, pedagogy. So sociocultural theories of learning help us do that by positing that fundamentally learning and identity processes occur together through participation in learning activities with others. However, we still don't have much clarity on what exactly are the interactional mechanisms by which learning and identity processes affect one another. We know roughly that greater identification with mathematics can lead to more robust engagement, which can in turn lead to um, deeper and, and more robust identities as mathematics learners. Um, but that broad point still somewhat frames learning and identification as sort of separate but related processes rather than more fundamentally integrated, which can lead to very different implications for teaching where um, pedagogical strategies that might relate to one or the other, like cognitively guided instruction to support learning and culturally relevant pedagogy to support healthy identity development, rather than a more integrated approach where the teaching of content is um, directly supporting identity development and vice versa. <clears throat> and so what my work uh, primarily posits, based on several findings that I'll, I'll share uh, some of that with you today, is that student authority relations 
during collaborative learning activities. That is, the ways in which students interact around and negotiate positions of both social and intellectual authority really illuminates and clarifies that link in ways that build on and contribute to sociocultural theories of learning and have implications for professional development and classroom instructional practices. And now, I want to, in this talk, kind of just lay out the argument and then um, take those implications for instruction and sort of leverage them to explain a PD uh, study that, um, supported by CSET, that we've been working on since, since coming here. So, uh, to be even, even more specific, uh, my work has found that student authority relations mediate the social construction of math knowledge through whose ideas become influential and therefore taken up as true or part of the solution path, and that student authority relations mediate the social construction of mathematics student identities through who becomes positioned as mathematically powerful. So today, I'd like to kind of break this argument down and make my case sort of piece by piece by drawing on a few of my studies to illuminate each point. So in particular, I'm first gonna argue that authority mediates the construction of knowledge by mediating influence. And then I'll illustrate that uh, authority relations mediate the construction of mathematical selves by mediating students' positionality as central or not to the mathematics learning activities. And then I want to offer um, an example of an analysis that focuses on both functions simultaneously and how they interrelate. And then finally, I want to move on to um, some implications for PD and then focus on a PD study that took these ideas um, in partnership with teachers. So, um, the first part of this journey begins in graduate school across the bay at UC Berkeley where Randy Engel was at the time a new assistant professor with um, a hot new publication that many of you may have heard about. It's a 2002 paper with Faith Cohen on productive disciplinary engagement. And in that paper, they analyzed a very heated student-led science debate to posit four principles that support productive disciplinary engagement. So one day, um, as a student working with, with Randy, she decided to uh, show us the video of this case um, as part of you know, discussing her paper. Uh, but as we watched it, um, another doctoral student at the time, Maxine McKinney Royston, who's now at um, UW-Madison, uh, we noticed that while certainly it was a case of robust, heated, even impassioned student engagement in a debate, there was something else about it that was pretty problematic. And in particular, the boy in the middle who's uh, standing up was able to garner a great deal of influence um, about the debate, ultimately convincing all but one student, uh, the girl who's sitting with the scrunchie, um, who became her nemesis, uh, his nemesis, to change their minds and adopt his position, even though his arguments, um, compared to all the other participants, um, and in particular compared to his nemesis, uh, were the sort of least quality arguments, the least, the least amount of evidence and um, least amount of justification and whatnot. So we were just wondering, like, how did he become so influential? How did he shift the debate in the ways that he did when it wasn't necessarily about the quality of the argumentation? So we reanalyzed the case in a paper that um, eventually came out in the Journal of Learning Sciences, and we wanted to model uh, how students became influential or not. And what we found was that his influence and the relative influence of others emerged out of the negotiation of five kinds of interactions. So we found that the first were uh, interactions around intellectual authority, which we defined as interactions during which a student is treated, act, or evaluated as a, cr a credible source of information. Um, the next was influence itself, which we defined as interactions that marked that a student's idea was taken up as true. <clears throat> the third was intellectual merit, which we defined as interactions during which a student's idea is positioned as high quality. And this may occur even if, like objectively, or you know, in sort of using Tolman's scheme of argumentation, uh, the idea wasn't particularly robust, perhaps incorrect or even misleading, but it was socially oriented to as a good idea. And then the fourth is access to the conversational floor which we define as the degree to which a student can initiate turns as desired and complete them without interruption. And then lastly, and then lastly is uh, what we call spatial privilege or access to uh, the space, uh, 
well, spatial privilege, which we defined as the degree to which a student was visually attended to and physically oriented to when speaking. And so <coughs> a key contribution of this work what, that we posited and based on the case that we oh, sorry, modeled um, is that these interactions relate to and affect each other in particular ways. So it's not just that these kinds of interactions contributed to an idea, the um, ideas of becoming influential in a general sense, but that they worked with each other in ways that could be predicted. So I, run, I really like the methodology that we use here, and it's a methodology that I've continued to use again and again um, in work that focuses on social interactions, where we coded every utterance in terms of bids, bids for the floor or bids for um, authority or bids for space, and then students or peers' responses, whether those bids were taken up um, and accepted or whether they were rejected. And this approach really helps us capture the interactional construction of particular social realities about students and their ideas, explaining how they became influential or not, and how particular students became positioned. So students who regularly bid and have those bids regularly rejected um, are positioned in ways that really demotes, say, these are bids around intellectual authority, we need the most intellectual authority. Students who regularly bid for authority, and that authority gets regularly taken up um, over time, can really be positioned very powerfully within, within the group. Um, so the figure here is um, one that we present, and it's complicated, and we don't have to totally get into it, uh, about the, the relationships between these components, right? So for example, um, we found that students first needed to have access to the interactional space, that is, bodies were generally um, oriented to students or shifted towards students, and once we saw evidence of those shifts, um, of that increased access of space, they were much more likely to get the floor, right? Or the opposite, if they suddenly became kind of occluded or bodies turned away from them, then you see uh, bids for the floor kind of get rejected and so on. Um, and what we found uh, was that this particular link here between authority and influence was particularly important. It was one of two kinds of interactions that led directly to influence, and the only interaction that was bi-directionally related mm -hmm. to influence, such that becoming positioned with authority led to influence, and moments of influence led back to being subsequently positioned again with authority. And so whether positive or negative, this kind of loop um, could create the condition where uh, pretty quickly a student could be um, become very powerful relative to others. And so I really wanted to start unpacking this relationship and understand it further. So um, later on, uh, not too much later, I had the opportunity to explore this relationship a bit more through an analysis of a ninth grade um, collaborative math classroom where I observed and videotaped uh, focal small groups that work together at different points of the year. Um, and I interviewed the Google students um, both on their math thinking and their experiences in the classroom. So these students worked in multi-team projects, uh, multi-week team projects all year, and had group roles during each project. So my interest in this study um, was kind of broadly to better understand the relationships between different kinds of talk during collaborative mathematical work, and in particular how talk served to move the task um, or the mathematics in the task further, um, and how the talk served to position students as particular kinds of people, especially in relation to groups and learning mathematics. So analytically, I focused on the functions of talk, and I focused on um, um, uh, task-related talk, mathematics-related talk, as well as positional functions with, uh, of talk, and how that was taken up by others. So unsurprisingly, the functions of talk were really largely mediated by their group roles. And one group role in particular, the role of group leader, um, enabled students the uh, access to really kind of enacting a particular form of authority. That is, the authority to issue directives to peers um, in the management of tasks. And so I followed this particular group, uh, three boys and a girl, who worked together at different points in the year. And during one project, Brianna was the group leader, and during another project, a boy, Kofi, was the group leader of the same group. So what I found was that Brianna and Kofi uh, performed the group leader role very similarly, um, but the forms of their directives were similar, the substance of their directives were similar, um, even the delivery of their directives were similar. However, group members responded 
pretty negatively to Brianna's directives, um, significantly more often than Kofi's directives. So group members successfully took up an average of about 30% of Brianna's directives, resisted about 47% of them, and ignored or rejected around 23% of them. And in contrast, Kofi had very little trouble managing the group. Um, in particular, his group members took up an average of about 77% of his directives, resisted about 16% of them, and ignored or rejected about 6% of them. Mm -hmm. So looking at the nature of their responses, uh, the group members increasingly positioned Brianna as bossy, uh, claiming that Brianna was overstepping her authority by assigning tasks and trying to keep students on task. And what you see in the right-hand um, um, figure is that over the course of the year, Brianna's is the one that starts really, really highly engaged at the top and then just plummets um, over the course of the year, even though she's an A student. Um, she becomes totally marginalized from the group, spatially, co uh, conversationally, um, in ways that she then frames um, uh, it, it as, as a academically um, in some interviews that I later had with her. So in an interview, um, Brianna offers a very gendered uh, mm. interpretation of what happened. And so she asserts, boys don't listen to girls. I mean, it's not just in the classroom, but it's outside too. It's like, I mean, they think they can control you, especially at high school. It's like they think they can control you. They're the man stuff. You're supposed to listen and all that stuff like that. So that's why the last time in, if you remember, I was yelling at them. Mm. And so I asked, um, well, how would you describe yourself as um, a student in the class? Um, and, and here you'll see that she recasts the experiences that she had with her group um, as having learned the lesson to stop working so hard and doing so much. And when I pushed her on this, a gendered interpretation emerged again. Um, so she says, you know, at the beginning of the year, I mean, I was like a workaholic. So now, I'm not so much of a workaholic, but I think it's because I have so much to do now. But I'm getting it. But before, I used to want it. Now, I don't so much. So I think when I came in, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, and all that stuff. And I think that's what it was. And I was just doing a little bit too much, but now I feel like I'm doing enough. So I asked, well, what do you think is, is the negative of working hard? And she said, I think it's because when I, like, I mean, especially like being in a group, I think I was, all I had was boys. So that also like, that put me in a tragedy. So Kofi on the other hand, makes meaning of his experiences in ways that show increased belonging and a desire for more mathematics experiences. Um, so I asked him the same question, how would you describe yourself as a student in this class? And Kofi answers, um, right now, I don't know, but I'm really interested in math. Uh, what do you like about it? It's challenging. It requires you to think. Before, it's not like uh, English, where you just have to read and write. Math actually requires you to think about what you're doing first. If you know, it's like if you're doing a, an equation and notice something's wrong, so something in your brain goes like, let me figure this out and see what's wrong. And then once you figure it out, you feel accomplished. You feel like you accomplished something good, and it's kind of like a good feeling. <coughs> Plus, it's like a workout for your brain, too. <coughs> so we see, um, in this case, that Brianna's enactments of authority, in particular, um, the, the social authority of, of, of um, uh, issuing directives to her peers, which were supported by the group leader role, and frankly by the teacher himself, um, were rejected by peers in ways that were organized by gender, and that seemed to marginalize her for the mathematical work of her group. Um, the ways in which this group negotiated access to particular kinds of authority ultimately positioned Brianna as an appropriate and bossy, not competent and helpful, which was how Kofi was positioned for the very similar kinds of authority bids and with the same students. So it's a case that illuminates, I think, a couple of important things. Um, one, that enacting authority is not a neutral act and does not simply emerge from local classroom norms, but, become, but can become situated in social and cultural histories around who gets to enact particular forms of authority. I think this is important because we're talking a lot about, especially in mathematics, but certainly in other disciplines, about the importance of um, student-led discussions and student-led work, and we're asking students to perform those 
kinds of um, performances of power, right, of intellectual power and of social power, uh, which is really important, right, uh, which we want students to do because they have these important implications of experiencing yourself as powerful, but we don't talk so much about what it means to ask particular kinds of students or to experience particular kinds of students enacting um, authority in ways that kind of socially and historically um, have not always been accepted. Um, Another thing that uh, comes out of this is that while intellectual authority is certainly central to what we're talking about, other more social forms of authority, in particular that right to issue directives, matters too in, in understanding how this is kind of going on. So, in bringing these ideas um, together, I applied these, um, these ideas to a case of collaborative problem solving among two fifth graders in order to track both the construction of a particular solution path and the positional identities between these two focal students. So I applied the influence framework to this case, um, looking again at bids for the floor, uh, for space, for merit, for authority, and the acceptance or rejection of those bids. Um, and this case is one that I think was particularly important because it's one where the interactional dynamics around authority very clearly and dramatically affected whose case, uh, whose ideas mattered. In this case, Anna's ideas mattered. And Jerome's role increasingly became taking on Anna's voice rather than finding his own. And then the dynamics around authority um, very clearly also affected not only uh, the construction of their particular solution path, but also their relative positionality. And it's also a particularly interesting case because Anna's ideas are actually um, riddled in confusion and fairly misleading. The actual paper goes you know, idea by idea in the construction of, of the solution. Um, here, I won't go into that because we'll run out of time. But um, what I do want to do is illustrate these dynamics through some video clips. Um, um, so, sorry. There we go. So, um, in this first set of video clips, uh, it shows how Jerome's engagement was perceived by the teacher and taken up by Anna. So in this data set, while we applied the influence framework, we also created new categories as necessary to capture the entire data corpus and found two other kinds of interactions very related to the original framework um, that we needed to take into account. One was the merit component, uh, which we expanded to include both intellectual merit um, or the perceived merit of ideas, but also social merit, or the perceived merit or sort of evaluation of behavior. We also found two forms of authority, uh, intellectual authority as in the original influence framework, but also directive authority, the social authority to issue directives to peers, which really resonated with the findings of the Brianna Kofi case and were very powerfully um, impactful here. So before um, I dive into these coded interactional clips, I want to say a bit about the context of the work just to sort of get some sense of what they're doing. So at the start of the lesson, uh, students were expected to cut a word problem from a worksheet and paste it onto a shared poster. And this was generally taken as um, one, a, word, a one person job. Uh, and across the classroom, you saw many partners waiting for that to occur before actually working on the problem together. Uh, but as you'll see, uh, Jerome is really the only student who's regularly called out by the teacher for it. And the way he's seated uh, also makes it difficult for him to be really close to Anna in the way that other students are with their partners, um, which might also oops, affect um, how the teacher was perceiving um, and evaluating Jerome's behavior, which really sets up the dynamics that Anna um, later takes up. Sorry, can you say what grade level is this? This is a fifth grade classroom in South Florida. I should mention here um, 
that at this point in time and for, and for, for much of this opening part, there's been one contribution to the solution where Jerome drew the first uh, part of the representation of the solution at um, Anna's directive, but it's really been the only thing written so far. So when she's talking about, are you going to do the work and you haven't done anything yet, in reality, he's the only one that's written any kind of contribution. So he gets a little confused, like, what are you talking about? You haven't done nothing yet. What? Why well, you haven't done anything? Which like a fucking to do that. Huh? Okay. We're gonna go on this roof. I didn't ask anyone over here to move. Yeah. 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 So Jerome's position as disengaged and problematically off task and in relation to Anna was linked to Anna becoming positioned with the right to issue directives to Jerome, um, as you'll see in the next set of clips. Oops. We need a I have to I need to sound like it. Do you want to ask Taylor? Do you want to ask him? We need her. We need her. Yeah. This just hurry up and draw down. Who's doing it? Okay, I'm writing. So. We're doing it. You haven't done nothing yet. What? Why oh, you haven't done anything? Much like a fucking around to do that. Okay. I'm not helping you do it. You think? Because I've been doing it. Okay, okay. So I'm going to make another piece. You're going to do something at the end of every period. And make sure you understand. Don't focus on this. Just focus on the question. What would that look like? She said, do this at the end. What would that look like? Embrace this. You just want to get the big mess on it. Is it trying to do the garden? Is it square section? Okay, I got two. First, I'm going to do three. Huh? Three only. Okay. Three. Only four, and that one is size 10. And then the rest of all ones. Okay. 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 Okay.
Oh, are you good? You think? Yeah? Okay. If you think that's good, then we'll go ahead to the next one. Okay, now, now that's going to be the end of the 70s. Hey, guys. Did you want to stand up and share that? Yes. So you see across these clips uh, that students, um, students that the authority relations was, was very central to the collaborative dynamics here, and um, that these authority relations were not shared. Rather, both social and intellectual authority uh, was concentrated in Anna in ways that mediated both their solution and their relative um, positionalities. So with respect to their um, positionings, Overall, this table shows the counts of particular kinds of interactional bids um, that were successfully taken up, which is the up part, or rejected, which is the down. Um, and if you imagine sort of the net of the ups and downs, offering a kind of marker, kind of weight to their relative positionalities, you see that, for example, with directive authority, Anna made 21 bids, 20 of which were taken up, only one of which was um, rejected, whereas Jerome uh, made seven bids for directive authority, four of which were rejected. So you can sort of see around social authority, Anna kind of has this net positional strength of 19 and Jerome of negative one. And you see across the board with respect to intellectual authority, um, social merit, the intellectual merit, influence, access to the floor and space, that Anna becomes positioned as far more powerful than, than Jerome um, along the same sorts of interact, uh, due to the same kinds of interactions that dictated how the construction of, of the solution path occurred. So in studying um, cases like this, uh, my research team and I began to ask, well, how might we structure learning spaces in ways that would prevent this sort of domination from occurring, right? How might we structure group work in ways that all students have the opportunity to get a foothold into the discussion and freely share their ideas that get genuinely taken into consideration by others? In other words, how do we support more shared authority? So this brings me to uh, the work that's been going on here at Stanford since I joined. Um, I had the opportunity to partner with CSET and um, a local elementary instructional team to attempt to leverage these insights uh, for professional development and further inquiry. So a couple of fortuitous opportunities arose my first year here. First, um, funding through CSET became available to support research meant to support um, elementary math instruction. And secondly, an instructional team at a local uh, culturally and linguistically diverse elementary school um, partnered with us um, through our teacher education program, reached out to me asking for support in implementing collaborative mathematics in their classroom. So this was a great opportunity to support uh, their needs and sort of their instructional goals and at the same time kind of have these five, these were the five different teachers, these five classroom spaces where we could kind of tinker with these ideas, see what kids were doing uh, with one another during these collaborative activities and just kind of keep working with teachers and learning. Um, so there were many aspects of our work together, uh, but here I want to focus on our video clubs whose purpose um, was to elevate teachers' noticing of students' collaborative dynamics. Um, in particular, these were videos of their own students in their own classrooms, focusing in particular on the table work that the teachers don't usually get to have a sneak peek of. Um, so here, teachers watched their and their colleague students at work, and uh, we asked, we, we had them ask themselves, how are students negotiating this work, and to what effect? To what effect? on who participates and in what ways, to what effect on their mathematical thinking, to what effect on progressing through the task, and so on. So it was this sort of integrated conversation that focused on how they were negotiating their dynamics, especially around authority and sort of what effects it had writ large. Um, and then we had them, um, after sort of vo voicing a lot of noticings, ask, well, what would students need to deepen their work with one another, and what might you try out in your classroom? So we didn't give them particular things to do. We invited them into sort of shared noticing and shared reflection. And then different teachers had sort of different ideas about what they might try, which gave us a great opportunity on the research end because we had these different trajectories of shifts in instructional practice that we can then document and analyze, of which two have surfaced as particularly powerful. And I'll just share a little glimpse of those. Um, but here's a quick example of the kinds of videos we watched. Um, and um, 
This one's from a fourth grade classroom. And while you watch it, I kind of want you to focus on, for instance, how students in this case were interpreting what it means to be inclusive. That is, what were their attempts to share intellectual authority with one another? Oh, um, let me just give you a little bit of context. So they are all, the, the original task is for them to represent a particular number with, um, in, in, in sticks of, of tens and ones and loose cubes. Um, eventually, the teacher realizes that there's not enough cubes for everybody to represent it on their own, so she has them work as a table. So at this point, they've started making their individual sticks, but now they're going to join forces. Oh, thank you. Can I have your eyes, please? I'm waiting for table two and table one. I'm noticing that you do not have the cubes to make 57. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I am going to change my mind. You can work as a table to solve it. Okay. I'm going to give you 10 minutes to do that. So we need to be cooperating as people to share we just want to share Take one of yours out because we don't have the money of those. This one's not mine. This one's a little bit of mine. Which one's yours? I can get these two. How do you know? Mine is this one. No, wait, mine is this one. I'll try to take that. Because Gordon also needs to be in here. Which one's yours? Which one's yours? Just one? So you kind of get the point. Um, so this is one example where teachers notice all sorts of things um, through these videos. It was really productive, and I'll show you some of the uh, preliminary analysis that we've, we've conducted on it. But um, in this case, for example, they noticed some of the things that they talked about was that what they realize that what looks like to them from their sort of vantage point as kids kind of off task, kind of fooling around, they got to intervene and say get back to work, was actually serious work from the perspective of the kids, right? Like they were ne negotiating these contributions and they were sort of taking seriously the idea that they all needed to be represented. Um, so uh, our teachers and our research team got together at three points across the year to kind of do this work. And um, it, itself it followed up uh, from a pretty intensive week-long summer PD. Um, and what we found, uh, this, is, this is a sort of work that, this is our first stab at, at analyzing the, the PD, um, was that teachers, oops, sorry, um, was that what, teacher, what teachers noticed uh, what built across the academic year. Um, their early noticings um, were around sort of early on kind of really noticing the challenges of collaboration for students. So there was just a lot of noticing that this was hard work and that students were work working very hard to do it. Um, the second thing they noticed were sort of a lot of noticings around the utility of social negotiation. So things like the negotiation of whose sticks were going to be included or what role certain people were going to play or um, who was going to sort of work with whom or with what materials. Those kinds of negotiations actually were quite powerful and important in moving the work forward. Um, a bit later on, the noticings were really kind of noticing the role of authority 
and its importance. So it led to sort of developing this shared rationale for locating authority within students. And then toward the end, uh, teachers were really focusing on what we call the brass tacks of collaboration. Like what were the specific details that made collaboration work? How were bodies oriented? What words were being used? Um, but interestingly, the ways that teachers connected those noticings to practice were the same all year long. <coughs> Regardless of what they were noticing, they often mapped it back to practice um, by reinterpreting prior experiences. So this is one where they'd be like, you know, now that I think about it, like I remember this time one, hmm, maybe it was the case that actually, right, often attributing far more competence and actually far more um, engagement in the task itself than teachers were sort of previously realizing about their students. Another way of connecting it was that they were kind of constantly mapping those noticings into this broader terrain of collaborative work. So how the struggles shifted from kindergarten through fourth grade, um, how they kind of connected it to what they were seeing in their language arts class or what now were the same kids. Um, and then finally, they were also just regularly kind of taking what they were noticing and identifying value and kind of naming what was needed to achieve it. So then teachers responded to these noticings um, and verbalized connections to practice in their own ways. And I'll give you um, two brief examples. This is a first grade teacher who really wanted to support her students in orienting to one another's ideas and engaging and sort of um, taking into consideration one another's ideas. And she decided that her students really just did not have the tools to even know how to do that. And she wanted to teach them explicitly how to revoice one another's ideas. So in this clip, this is the second um, time that they come together to revisit this idea of revoicing. The first one, she kind of modeled it, they practiced it, they practiced it again, um, and then they went and tried it out. Here, they're launching a new lesson, they're practicing revoicing again, um, and she's building on it to include uh, the need to establish agreement. Um, so you'll see the kids uh, kind of practice this, and then the clip jumps to a particular small group, and you see the two students just sort of take this up. How's it be? Do you need more time?
teacher went in a really different direction with her students. Um, she decided to, so she, um, all the teachers at some level kind of had the same activity structure where they launched a, uh, the, the, the lesson of that day with a, car, a whole class carpet discussion. Um, then students went off and did their uh, table work and then they came back to the carpet, sort of like a closing whole class discussion. And she focused in particular on kind of launching the math and launching the task. So what she did here was that she included in these launching and then later reflection conversations questions around how do we do this work together? What does it mean to be productive? What does it look like? What does it sound like? Uh, which I'll show you a clip of. And then when they would come back from their collaborative work, she would say, you know, how did it go? Who found it hard? What was hard about it? Mm -hmm. and they would surface these issues, and then she'd go back to the students and say, well, who has successful partnerships? What advice do you have? So her goal was much like positioning students with sort of the agency and kind of ownership of their mathematical ideas, she also wanted to position them with that sort of ownership of the collaborative process itself. Um, and you see uh, over the course of the year, students, um, you know, she's able to sort of launch it. They pick their partners. Um, they realize maybe they shouldn't be working with their best friend, right? They, um, you know, so you're seeing them sort of more fluidly kind of take on um, ownership over the dynamic. So in this clip, you just see her uh, first attempt to kind of introduce this idea and to help students start thinking about what does it look like and sound like to have these kinds of collaborations. But it is still our math work time. So I'm thinking of a word that will help us to remember what we should do even when there's distraction. So what kind of a work time do we need to have? Diana? What? A productive work time. Can you remind us what that means? Let's wait who's in your group and think about who you think you can be productive with. When you have someone that you think you can be productive with, can you just show me a thumbs up? conversation kind of continues around and what how else might we sit how might we orient our bodies how might we speak to each other so in conclusion um, some of the thoughts that come out of this and that I've been illuminating kind of over um, as uh, authority relations seem to really drive the collaborative problem-solving process in ways that mediate both the social construction of learning or the social construction of knowledge and of identity um, the negotiation of authority, both intellectual and social, can become complicated by broader social and cultural histories about who can enact power and in what ways. Uh, likewise, teachers can learn to notice these dynamics and connect their noticings to practice in ways to support increasingly shared authority among students, promoting both equity and productivity. And thank you. <laughs> I, 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 the whole, your whole presentation, I've been wondering if you have applied this framework in um, multilingual settings, and what have you found that is different from uh, 
um, monolingual, traditional monolingual classrooms? I have not. I wanted to. I, uh, so years ago when I was in Miami, I put in a proposal to do exactly that because I had a hunch that when students, uh, bilingual students in uh, dual language spaces where they can use the um, entirety of their kind of linguistic repertoire, mm -hmm. that there would be expanded sort of access to different positional identities of power. So I was just very curious about how these dynamics might work differently in that space. But um, I wasn't able to get the, di I wasn't able to do it. <laughs> So it's still on my mind, and I'd love I'd love to think about that. Um, but I ha yeah, I haven't done it. But I would I would conjecture that in um, thinking in particular about language learners, that in spaces where uh, English is the language of instruction and mathematics is happening in English, and those negotiations are therefore kind of linguistically restricted, that we're gonna ha we're gonna see students having um, sort of navigating more narrow pathways of negotiating sort of ideas and identities of power than in these more linguistically expanded spaces where students can um, they have they have a they have a more holistic repertoire to do that negotiating with. That would that was I was curious to see if that would be the case. But yeah. I will also be curious like these programs that are 50 50 yeah. where mm -hmm. his where Hispanic students are the language authority for the yes. others to learn mm -hmm. yeah. the language. How mm -hmm. if that will position them in in if it will be different mm -hmm. when they are negotiating in Spanish because they are the authority yes. than when the others are negotiating with them in English that bad. Yeah. That would be particularly cool because in those spaces where, I know they have different models, but there's models where they're essentially taking two math classes, um, yeah. mm -hmm. the contenido and then the and they have to pass English one, and they have to pass them both. So these are the same students mm -hmm. uh, be doing yeah. you know, similar work where different languages being emphasized, how would that sort of uh, uh, mm -hmm. affect the, the, the power the power plays that go on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, be really interesting. And sort of the implications for like the vast majority of schools that are language restricted in English only. So yeah, mm -hmm. that would be really interesting. And one of the mathematics they can show and display their competency in language. Mm -hmm. Right. As well, yeah. Right, right, right. This doesn't play into the, your dream like, uh, experiment. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the idea that we're collecting in San Francisco middle schools right now, we have lots of yeah. small groups of students. Mm -hmm. There's some number of the classrooms where students are using what I assume is their first language. It's at least a language other than English. They're not the dual. Right, it's bilingual. That's the Well, no, oh, it's no. monolingual, yeah, yeah, it's and monolingual. the kids are using the their language. It's one scenario. Right. But then right. we also right. have a Mandarin classroom, well, don't we? Also, we? So it's interesting because like it's all different contexts. So sometimes yeah. the teacher I'm gonna move over here. Her, sometimes the teacher, her first language is other than English. Right. And so she will instruct bilingually. Right. And there's other instances where right. the teacher will instruct monolingually, but in her first language. Right. Which right. might be Mandarin. Mm -hmm. And so in all of those classrooms, it's been a really fascinating, interesting thing where, I mean, one interaction that I've been looking at is specifically like, where there are three kids who are all uh, English language learners. One's newcomer, one's been there a couple of years, and one is, um, I think, I think second generation, mm -hmm. because they kind of talk about it in Spanish to each other, and the one says, no, I want to speak English, right. I don't want to speak Spanish, yeah. but he totally knows everything that's going on, and the other student doesn't know what's going on in English, and right. it's just like, but the teacher is bilingual, yeah. and will enter and speak in the languages that the kids prefer is a lot yeah. going on. Yeah. But then we have other classrooms where I'm pretty sure the teacher doesn't know the kids' language. Yes. And right. Particularly it's, when it's, it's Spanish, it's, Anthony can pick up what they're saying. Yeah, yeah. it's like it's it's so fascinating. Sorry, there's like yeah. But it's yeah. I, I wonder about like because in these kind of like in those kind of spaces how the how the intellectual authority does shift when one student asserts that they're going to do it in this language mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the other one asserts no we're going to do it in this mm -hmm. and 
the kid gets caught in between, there's a lot like that that keeps playing on that. So when you're ready for another data set. If you would like another, <laughs> another corpus to like <laughs> dissect. I don't know, Rosie, you think we're ready for another data set? Do you want to hear ready? Come on. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that my question bridges the we're teasing, but not teasing. Yeah, um, yeah, we're really not. <laughs> when you think about your framework that you put up at the very beginning. Yes. In your mind, does it transcend grade level and subject matter? Yes. So it was originally developed in a, through a science debate. That's what I thought. At, at the elementary level. Um, but I've applied it at, at the secondary level as well. Because um, it looked content neutral to me. Right. Yeah. The reason I find it particular, I, it's sort of like both and. Yes, I do think it is applicable across the board um, in thinking about how ideas become influential. I think that um, how it plays out in mathematics is particularly interesting to me because of a couple of reasons. Like one, on the one hand, the role of mathematics as a discipline um, infused with a great deal of power. So just access to that identity as a powerful math learner is it, it's 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 got kind of high stakes. Um, and what it means to be a mathematics kind of person is so fundamentally infused with intellectual authority and competence. And, and it's itself very loaded intellectual authority because it's so linked to smartness and sort of general intelligence. Like, mm -hmm. if you're good in math, you're smart. Right. And if you're great in math, you're like a genius, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's so much at stake with math, especially around authority and who gets access to it, that I think that these dynamics <coughs> play out particularly saliently and interestingly, but regardless, uh, yes, I do think that this idea of um, getting access to the floor, being oriented to, and how students orient to ideas, and who becomes influential um, is sort of, I, in fact, when we were first developing this model, it was during a time of um, the presidential elections, like this was a while back, um, and we kept seeing the same sorts of I was just going to, I had that same, you that picked those up and I could just. The student was doing. Yeah. Right, I was seeing all the debates from a year ago. To grab the space, <laughs> right, to assert these yeah. ridiculous things that their party <laughs> members would be like, that is a brilliant idea, you yeah. know? And we'd just be like, oh my god, we can like map yeah. uh, American politics through this. So I do think it's good. That was going to be one of my other questions for you too. <laughs> yeah, like we, we grown ups are not immune to such things, mm -hmm. yeah. Did you did you happen to see like so I, I, you kind of got to it at the the last two clips of the teachers like in your PDs uh, how mathematics is kind of like set up as less of a, a privileged powerful because I I mean we think of like mathematics as like a powerful thing and contributing to the intellectual authority but was there a shift in the, the way the teachers talked about mathematics and what mathematics was and how answers were and then we probably yeah. saw shifts within the groups of themselves well certainly. Um it, with this particular group of teachers, uh, they had been for a few years, this is at the elementary level, so they're teaching all subject areas, and they had been for a few years in their language arts class doing like readers and writers workshop and in science doing inquiry. Like they had, they had become comfortable and really loved um, kind of collaborative student-centered approaches in everything but math. Like mm. math was the thing where math is different, you can't teach it that way, right? Like, you, how do you even do this? And they, how this all started was that then our steppies were in their classrooms, these were their CTs, mm -hmm. and they were doing uh, context for learning lessons, they were doing collaborative lessons, and the teachers were like, oh, will you show us how to do this? Like, will yeah. you support us in doing this? So once they kind of saw the vision for math, it was, really powerful because first of all math could then fit <coughs> seamlessly throughout their day like all day long they're creating these spaces for students um, some of the things that they notice were that moves that they kind of do in these other content spaces could also help in math um, what I didn't see with these teachers because they didn't come in with this lens was this idea that like math is right or wrong. There wasn't really resistance. It was more like, I don't see how we can do this. And then they were like, oh my gosh, we can do this, let's do this. Um, they did recast like their prior experiences with their students over and over again. They were like, oh, I'm like seeing so many things differently. Um, but we didn't have with this particular group that kind of resistance of like, well, real math is right and wrong and procedurally oriented. It, it wasn't quite that 
although other times I've worked with teachers, certainly that's a yeah, big yeah. space of resistance to yeah. sort of talk through. Yeah. Did they choose their interventions? The, you know how you modeled what the teachers did with their kids? Or, yes. I mean, not you modeled, you, you showed the videos. Did they choose those solutions, interventions, whatever yes. you want to label them? Yes. How did they come up with them? So in our in our PD, uh, we would watch these clips and discuss and notice and then just sort of, you know, um, piggyback on each other's ideas. And then they would reflect on, well, what does this seem like students need? So some of the things might be like, well, they need greater support on how to do this. Mm -hmm. like, they need to be taught even to the point that like bodies should be oriented to each other. They need to be taught like how to listen and then, you know, how so so that was sort of one and then teachers kind of ran with that. Um, so in so I guess the, the answer is in the reflection of what do students need and then our final prompt was like what might you try next? And so it became very playful and they wanted to sort of try out these things. Um, and they tried out different things and we sort of kept following them. And so they kind of just came up with it there together, not individually, it was all okay. socially sort of it was in discussion. Some ideas became exciting to particular teachers and they wanted to try those things out. Um, and then other ideas became exciting to other teachers and they wanted to try those things out. Yeah. I'm going to piggyback up because you said something like, because I've heard some pushback from teachers about the idea of what participation means from mm -hmm. like, they have a lot of immigrants from different countries and how eye gaze may not be as socially mm -hmm. acceptable or, or talking without being talking to. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering in that whole discussion about what it means to listen to your partner, like how, how student generated was that or was it like the, the teacher kind of fishing for like this is what I think the normative like participatory like learning structure mm -hmm. or listen, you know, not, do, you, do you see how yeah, I'm going with that? Yeah. I'm interested in that. Uh, on the end of, um, Sort of the the who who the students were culturally and linguistically. Mm -hmm. The focus was actually more early on. This was mm -hmm. early on. It it then um, was you know once they started kind of doing this work, it wasn't it wasn't as much of a concern. But early on, they thought, how do we do this work with our kids in math when our kids are language learners across different languages mm -hmm. and. This is math discourse, which is particularly academic. They might not have these words in either language. Um, like, how do we facilitate these discussions in math when they're still learning the language of instruction? That feels like a really big obstacle. So we brought in Judith Moscovich, right, from yeah. East Santa Cruz. That's her bread and butter. And she worked with, this was over the summer. Like, the summer was a pretty intensive PD where we were just trying to lay the groundwork and get on the same page around how to launch this work and how to think about this work. Um, so, but there wasn't ever really conversation around um, feeling like their kids, there, w there was definitely a lot of developmental conversations, like the kindergarten teacher um, being, you know, sort of being like, what I can expect from the kids mm -hmm. is not that much, and she kept sort of pushing herself to see how much their competencies really actually could be at such a young age, but there wasn't really any conversation around um, from a cultural perspective, mm -hmm. my kids might want to interact in different ways with one another. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, at the same time, I'm wondering maybe that's why that's where the teacher's role comes in. They make mm -hmm. it explicit. In this classroom, when we do math or mm -hmm. when we learn this, we position our bodies directly toward each other, or right. we mm -hmm. look at each other. Yes, mm -hmm. right, right. That's why it needs to be articulated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, but then, like, what what are the implications of, you know, yeah. the teacher right, right, setting right, right. that yeah. as the standard for this class? Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. But, Which is a great conversation to have. Yeah. It's a great conversation yeah. to have, yeah. 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 I mean, those kinds of issues were much more likely to be framed, and I think it made sense because it was a multi-year team, like kindergarten through fourth grade was represented, so it often was from a developmental perspective, like what have they learned to do yet or are capable of doing at this point. Um, so like um, all of the teachers agreed that all of the students needed much more support in the mechanics of how to do this. That they realize that they assume that you can put kids together and sort of say, go work together, and that they have a sense of how to do that and what mm -hmm. that means. Mm -hmm. And in watching it, they thought, well, they're working really hard to do this, like harder than I realized, but man, it is hard, and they need to be taught 
Um, you know, so it's actually kind of really interesting where one of the insights was maybe the like direct instruction is really around these sort of interactional mechanisms mm -hmm. and not the content. And if we can just get those sorts of tools mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. then um, we've still, we're, make, we're creating the conditions under which they can really explore the math and discover ideas on their own, mm -hmm. um, which was exciting and which kind of bore out over time. Mm -hmm. Wondering about the uh, the explanations that like the students give when their bids aren't accepted, right? Mm -hmm. The explanations of how, like Brianna, standard explanation, right? Mm -hmm. And how if, are you noticing interesting patterns there, like that maybe maybe Brianna's absolutely correct that it was mm -hmm. that an unfair playing field in that in that situation? Mm -hmm. Are you noticing anything about student reactions there? And do you think that's an interesting area for intervention? Yeah, like. Yeah. That metacognitive sort of right, right, space. Right. Yeah. So I've got like two different <laughs> thoughts on that. Yeah. On the one hand, um, with these kids, this is actually an analysis we're doing right now. It's an uh, exciting analysis. So interactionally, what would they do when their bids were rejected? Um, so what we're finding is that often kids shift to off-task talk. This has been a really interesting analysis and in noticing that like in the full range of when kids go off task or start socializing, that actually it seems like a relative minority of the time, it's just sort of a lost cause, they just unravel and they're just sort of, it's not kind of going anywhere. For a hmm. large chunk of it, this we're like in this analysis right now, so I'm like conclusive, right. but um, it actually has pop, pr pr um, productive functions. So for example, um, students who, I'll give, I'll give one example like the Minecraft example, so there'll be a, there's a student who, uh, they're at a table with, with others and they're bidding for the floor, they're bidding for materials, yeah. they're just bid after bid after bid and he's just totally ignored. So he shifts into talk about Minecraft and he's like, I was playing Minecraft and I was on this horse mm -hmm. and I was the first one on the horse and I was setting the villages on fire and you see interaction like all the bodies are <laughs> shift to him, yeah. right? The gaze shifts yeah, to yeah, him. Yeah. Right, and at that moment, he reaches over, he grabs the materials, he grabs the box, he gives his contribution that they should put the 10 sticks into that basket, and they all get like on, on task. Mm -hmm. right? So there's lots of like uh, moments like that yeah, yeah. where, or a student who like wants to get on task, but nobody else really is, and they'll um, go into off-task conversation that just sort of starts recruiting students mm -hmm. into it, and then it shifts into on-task talk. Mm -hmm. So one thing we're finding, like, like the way I theorize around that yeah. <coughs> is from the sort of discourse of mathematics, right? So like just from the realm of mathematics, there's only so many positions that one can enter into. And if you don't have quite access through that discourse, you're sort of blocked off. And so uh, when students start pulling on youth popular culture, sort of other kinds of spaces, like friendships and whatnot, it expands kind of the realm of positional possibilities and they can find other spaces of power that at the minimum serve to uh, gain attention, which sometimes that's all it does and doesn't do much more, but often it goes beyond just gaining the attention and they can enter or recruit. Yeah. Oh, then the other one about Brianna. This is something I think about a lot because for years people would say, well, you know, in the, in the broader study you're seeing all of these things that the teacher did. The teacher did all sorts of fabulous things, right? So it's just like, great. Like what, you know, what are we supposed to do? And, um, and uh, but in thinking about what these teachers did, like in particular, um, the fourth grade teacher around asking the question, like what does it mean to do this work? What might be hard about it? I could imagine, the thought experiment, right? I yeah. didn't actually do this, but I could imagine that this teacher could have engaged in that kind of conversation, so this is not something that he did, right? Um, and that potentially this idea of like, boys don't listen to girls becomes surfaced. Yeah. And it can become confronted and sort of dealt with, along with whatever other problematic dynamics that I didn't happen to capture because the camera wasn't on those kids. Um, so that's, so I do feel like some of the things that we're gleaning here can have broader intervention type um, possibilities even when, so at the elementary level it might not be particularly kind of socio-political and the kinds of things that kids talk about on surface. At the secondary level it certainly might more likely, but it might create a, a, an entry into those kinds of conversations very much grounded in sort of how do we do this work, right? Um, 
So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just found that the off-task thing was really interesting to me because I think so many times teachers get stuck in a situation as an adversary coming over. Yeah. And then it changes the role of the teacher and the student, the lack of trust. Yes. And if that could message could be explained to teachers that like, sometimes you have to just let it go. Yes. A little mm -hmm. good things. Yeah. yeah. Part of I can't tell you how many times I've made a mistake, put my foot in my mouth, and my kid was looking up, especially in high school, it's yeah. hard with devices. Was actually looking something up online or doing something on Desmos and like, huh. right? You know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I agree. Like, in fact, we're finding like when the teacher comes, off more often than not, it just sort of blows things up. But mm -hmm. so we we're not there yet, but we almost want to create like kind of like a triage model, right? Yeah. Like what um like of the grant of the larger realm of off task talk, what are some yeah. signs that you shouldn't step in? Just let them mm -hmm. struggle and be. And when do you step in? When is it the case that they think they're done? So now they're going to be kind of playing around. <coughs> and you should intervene and say, well, how about this, right? Or kind of point out maybe they're not done. They think they're done, but they, they you know, there's more to do. Or maybe they are done. You've got to give them sort of another challenge. That's a big one. They think they're done. So they kind of dismantle and maybe they're really not. <coughs> another one that does happen is <coughs> that they're just avoiding work. So what does it look like when they're avoiding work rather than kind of struggling through getting a foothold or sort of recruiting one another? We're trying, to, we're trying to get those patterns out so that we can offer that as a resource to teachers too. Like when you're looking around at the gaze and you're sort of listening in, that's one of them. It's like before stepping in, just kind of stop and look and listen from, a little, from a behind for a little bit, right? Kind of diagnose what's happening rather than just walking in. So little things like that, but we're, yeah, it's like definitely on our minds in conversation. I wonder if that's the teacher thought in the, the excuse me the drill, uh, in the uh, Miami in the Florida yeah, yeah. Um, whether she was in, if the camera was not on whether she would have jumped in there unless she felt embarrassed that her kids were right right of, so maybe that's something with research I yeah, guess you dealt right. a lot though uh, there were multiple cameras so there were they weren't the only group there were multiple groups on there. Um, but that might have been the case. She might have been a little bit extra heightened with Jerome because he was one of the groups with the cameras on and she knew that we were going to be sort of videotaping that. Um, I didn't see any kind of heightened attention to any of the other groups that had cameras on them with respect to the teacher. But then I think like even if that were the case that we sort of um, kind of tainted that interaction a bit through the existence of just sort of being there. It's sort of nevertheless the case that it showed like how powerful those evaluations can be um, in setting those dynamics in motion. Um, I think, so this isn't in the paper because unlike in the Brianna Kofi one where Brianna herself and, and Kofi also in other interviews gives this gendered interpretation, I don't have those words coming out of the kids' uh, mouths, but if you kind of situate it in other literatures around the policing of uh, black boys, right, and their mm -hmm. behaviors in particular, you kind of see that this follows a, 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 a pattern that you see elsewhere. So I think that was at play. Um, but it may be the case that it was exacerbated because it was one of the ones with the camera in front. Yeah. An interesting thing with, with this group though, Anna and Jerome talking about like how that original sort of positioning can set the stage for things. Um, there's another moment where Anna and Jerome have to work together again and there's, um, it has nothing to do with the lesson. It's a separate thing where they do like online math homework that's just sort of drill and procedures like sort of shooting math answers or whatever, math facts. And she had posted like the top scores on the, on the board. Um, and they were about to start their work and Anna looked over and happened to notice that Jerome was the number one top scorer. And she was like, what? And so Jerome was like, yeah. And so when they started, you're seeing Anna give all those same directives, like, do this, we're going to do that. But Jerome, because this was like, I think, that original positioning, like, set a different stage, he was much more likely to be like, nope, nope, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this. We're doing it this way, right? And it really evened things out between them. So that, so this was also the teacher, although in a very different way. So this part about, like, it resonates with some of the complex instruction stuff around status intervention, right? Like. 
in one case, his status was sort of demoted from an engagement perspective, and the other one, his status was sort of elevated from like a smartness or whatever top scoring kind of perspective, mm -hmm. and it mattered, um, even just like in those local moments. Yeah. All right, we are welcome to continue the conversation casually. There are treats and beverages outside the door. Uh, help yourself to those because they don't keep forever. <laughs> uh, but let's thank Jenny for the thought yeah. and the <coughs> And you're all going to think about how you engage with whom mm. tonight and tomorrow <laughs> and beyond. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So it's hard to get. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Power. This one. For this feature, this is one of the first. Yeah. If you're really busy, but I'm good. These are spicy. Go ahead. I was going to say I have the memory of that you had a child with ice cream. Yeah. 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 Yeah.